very warm welcome to lovers of mathematics all over the world. My name is Kumar Murthy, and I'm the director of the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences. On behalf of the Institute, thank you for joining us at the public opening of the 2021 Fields Medal Symposium. Although we're meeting remotely, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vendat the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The world recently witnessed the incredible spectacle of the Olympic Games in Tokyo. An international tradition for over a century, the Games bring together not only athletes, but many of us who, though not athletes, find inspiration in their aspirations and achievements. We find them inspiring because they push the boundaries of the possible and give participants and spectators alike a sense that the highest aspirations of the human spirit are possible and worth striving for. Our event today is of a similar spirit in the arena of mathematics. It's about the creative journey of the human spirit, wanting to peer beyond the known wanting to push back the limits of our knowledge, of overcoming difficulties and dealing with setbacks, and of ultimately achieving new successes. It's the human story of how mathematics is done, as captured in the achievements of 2018 Fields medalist, Peter Scholze. Peter Scholze was awarded the medal for transforming arithmetic algebraic geometry over periodic fields through his introduction of perfect poet spaces with application to Galois representations and for the development of new cohomology theories. Now, if that sounds like a mouthful, then let's focus on this. Peter was just 16 when Andrew Wiles announced his proof of Fermat's last theorem. And just a few years later, he had his own breakthrough with a piece of work that experts described as stunning, revolutionary, and humbling. His approach and way of thinking has led to a whole new way of looking at problems in the field greatly simplifying some aspects and making possible others that seemed inaccessible. It's reminiscent of the advice of American philosopher Emerson to not go where the path may lead, but to go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. That's not just a gold medal performance for Peter himself, but the discovery of ideas that I suspect will lead to gold medals for many others. Many of you are familiar with the Fields Medal and the Fields Institute, but for those who are new, let me say that both are named after John Charles Fields, a visionary Canadian academic. In true Olympic spirit, Fields felt that both individuals and nations would come together and cooperate through mathematics. He was especially keen on encouraging and promoting young researchers, mathematical scientists who are at an early stage of their scientific career and who show great future promise. Both the Fields Medal and the Fields Institute have continued to honor the legacy of John Charles Fields in emphasizing the international cooperation that is the foundation of mathematical research and the encouragement of young minds who are embarking on their own mathematical journey. Each year, the Fields Institute hosts over 150 workshops, conferences, seminar series, outreach activities, graduate courses, and special lectures. And each year, it draws close to 10,000 participants from around the world. All of this activity would not be possible without our many enthusiastic and generous supporters. The Fields Institute receives generous funding from the province of Ontario, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the National Science Foundation of the United States, and the Simons Foundation. We're also supported by nine principal sponsoring universities across Ontario, 11 affiliate universities, corporate partners, and even generous private donors like many of you. We are deeply grateful to all of you for enabling us to do what we love most, the study and communication of mathematics. Since the start of the pandemic, our events have shifted online. This is our second year holding the Fields Medal Symposium online. Though we lose the opportunity to interact in person, we can connect with an infinitely wider audience around the world. Consequently, this year's symposium will include speakers in Germany, the United States, and Canada, and will have a truly global audience. We are grateful 
for the opportunity to reach mathematics enthusiasts the world over. We begin our program with a message from the Honorable Elizabeth Doudswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. This will be followed by a number of messages of greeting from dignitaries and leaders. Once again, I thank you for joining us for what is sure to be a wonderful event in celebration of mathematics. I now invite the Honorable Elizabeth Doudswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, to share a message of greeting with all of us. Honored guests from around the globe, welcome. Bonjour, bonjour. I join Dr. Murthy in acknowledging and respecting the stewardship of these lands by Indigenous peoples. We have so much to learn from their traditional ways of knowing. We're gathering virtually for this symposium because of the remarkable legacy of John Charles Fields. As the preeminent Canadian mathematician of the early 20th century, he believed, as his fellow Ontarians do today, in the importance of looking outward, of learning from and contributing to the world beyond our borders. Significantly, he used his position in the field of mathematics to encourage understanding between cultures. Fields organized the first ever International Congress of Mathematicians to be held in Canada, in Toronto, in 1924. And eight years later, in his will, he left funds to endow the Fields Medal. His biographers, Elizabeth McKinnon Ream and Francis Hoffman, tells us that this was, and I quote, his way of doing what he could to heal the rift among his colleagues, particularly the French and the Germans. He would be proud to know how relevant his work continues to be, both in encouraging the development of important research by young mathematicians, but also in revealing and strengthening the connections between scholars across countries and continents. In the midst of a global pandemic, our interdependence has become clear as never before. We are indeed mutually vulnerable. And we as humans will solve the global challenges we face only if we work together. I need not remind this audience that mathematics is crucial to this endeavor. The study of pure mathematics may be elusive to many of us, but the potential of the tools of applied mathematics can be optimistically and enthusiastically understood by most. It is indeed a universal language through which we navigate our daily lives. And when faced with a global pandemic or the existing existential challenge of climate change, mathematics is crucial to a comprehensive understanding of the phenomena. It makes possible the models that allow us to predict, mitigate, and we hope diminish the potential impacts on society. We may yet be able to responsibly shepherd the development of artificial intelligence or to design economic systems that effectively bridge the great divide between the rich and the poor. And the Fields Institute plays a vital role in fostering that very breadth of the discipline. As the Queen's representative in Ontario, and on behalf of a grateful province, I thank Dr. Murthy and the Fields Institute for this work, for your public outreach, and for championing inclusion in the study of mathematics. Today, we look forward to the fascinating window you will offer all of us into the research of the German mathematician and winner of the Fields Medal in 2018, Peter Schultz. Now, I would be the first amongst you to acknowledge my ignorance about the specialized field of arithmetic geometry, but I can readily recognize the value of any tools and approaches that contribute to problem solving. At this unique moment, when we aim to bring about a better normal in the wake of a health pandemic, at the very same time as we awaken to the dramatic, impending challenge of climate change, 
Society simply needs the best and the brightest of minds. So this is a perfect time to celebrate Dr. Schultz's achievement in the pursuit of knowledge. Enjoy the symposium. Merci, miigwech. Herzlich grüße ich Sie aus Nordrhein-Westfalen, dem Land in Deutschland, das wie kaum ein anderes einen tiefgreifenden Strukturwandel erlebt hat. Vom Industrieland mit Bergbau, Kohle und Stahl zu einem der bedeutendsten europäischen Standorte für exzellente Lehre und Forschung. Dazu haben die zahlreichen Universitäten in unserem Land beigetragen, darunter die Rheinische Friedrich-Wilhelms-Universität Bonn, an der Professor Scholze seit vielen Jahren lehrt und forscht und dessen Arbeit Sie in diesem Jahr ganz besonders ehren und würdigen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Professor Scholze vor drei Jahren mit der Fields-Medaille für seinen beeindruckenden wissenschaftlichen Beitrag ausgezeichnet wurde, wie vor ihm bereits Professor Gerd Faltings, ebenfalls von der Universität in Bonn. Wir in Nordrhein-Westfalen sind sehr stolz, auf die herausragenden Leistungen dieser Wissenschaftler, die unser Land zu einem außergewöhnlichen Wissenschaftsstandort machen. Als Professor Scholze die Fields-Medaille verliehen wurde, ist viel über ihn geschrieben und berichtet worden, dass er ein wissenschaftliches Ausnahmetalent sei, dass er schon in jungen Jahren viel geleistet und erreicht hat und dass er bereits zu Beginn seiner akademischen Laufbahn bahnbrechendes im Bereich der arithmetischen Geometrie erforscht habe, als er eine neue Klasse von geometrischen Strukturen, die perfektuiden Räume, entdeckte. Nun kann und will ich diese Leistung fachlich nicht bewerten. Das können Sie viel besser. Aber ich weiß, dass ihm der damit verbundene Ruhm und der ganze Rummel um seine Person ohnehin nicht angenehm ist. Wir in Nordrhein-Westfalen sind dankbar dafür, dass hier bei uns ein Mathematiker wie er exzellent, bescheiden und sympathisch nicht nur forscht, sondern auch junge Menschen für die Mathematik begeistert. Ihnen allen wünsche ich ein spannendes Symposium und Ihnen, lieber Herr Professor Scholze, wünsche ich alles Gute für Ihre Zukunft und weiterhin viel Erfolg. Es kommt uns allen zugute. Welcome to the Fields Medal Symposium. This is one of the highest honors in the world for any mathematician to receive. As German ambassador here in Canada, I'm very proud and happy that uh, Professor Scholze, a, an eminent mathematician from my home region in the Rhineland, has been chosen. Congratulations, Professor Scholze. A Canadian award for an outstanding young German mathematician, I believe, is just another very fitting highlight for the extraordinary scientific cooperation that unites our two countries, and it does so since 50 years. It may surprise you, but there is no more intense per capita cooperation in the sciences than with any other country uh, than with Canada and Germany. Canada hosts multiple Max Planck Institutes, Helmholtz corporations. We have 700 university corporations. So it is a very strong relationship. And it's a tourism. Our investment in and our dedication to science will determine how our nations fare in the global competition that's ongoing. Well, Germany and Canada are very engaged in that, in particular also in giving the space and the means also to fundamental science. We have a famous German-Canadian promoter of that, Gerhard Herzberg, the physicist chemist who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry 50 years ago, um, was very vocal in promoting investment into fundamental science. He is a great example of what our cooperation can bring. We have just named our scientific network in his honor. 
And I would invite you all, if you can, to look into that. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you, Herr Minister President, for your words of welcome and support and for illustrating the full and meaningful role that mathematics and the Fields Institute play in forming strong international connections and in addressing the global problems that we all face. We now welcome Professor Jared Weinstein of Boston University to introduce Peter Schultz's work and career. Professor Weinstein's research fields include number theory, arithmetic geometry, automorphic forms, and representation theory. He has published a book with Peter called the Berkeley Lectures on Piadic Geometry and is well positioned to explain Peter's work to us today. Now, over to Jared. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Fields Medal Symposium in honor of Peter Schulze. I'm Jared Weinstein, professor of mathematics at Boston University, and it is my great pleasure and honor to be giving this introduction to Schulze's work. So who is Peter Schulze and what are his contributions to mathematics? Schulze was born in Dresden in 1987 and grew up in Berlin. Early on, he displayed an extraordinary talent in mathematics by winning three gold medals and one silver medal at the International Mathematics Olympiad, a contest for high school students featuring fiendishly difficult problems. Schulze attended the University of Bonn and completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in the space of five years. His doctoral advisor was Michael Rappaport, whose advisor in turn was Pierre Deligne, winner of the 1978 Fields Medal. Schultz's dissertation at Bonn settled a problem posed by Deligne decades earlier. This dissertation, which carried the title Perfectoid Spaces, was an instant sensation. Now, we'll get to what perfectoid spaces actually are in a moment, but suffice it to say, the appearance of the idea was a tectonic shift for the field. In universities and institutions throughout the world, professors and students gathered in seminars for a few hours a week just to discuss the ideas of this 22-year-old from Bonn. There were international conferences, special semesters, graduate student workshops, and all manner of publications devoted to the topic of perfectoid spaces. Anyone researching in the field of arithmetic geometry quickly realized that Schultz's dissertation on perfectoid spaces was required reading. In 2011, Schultze himself came to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey to give lectures and meet the researchers who were working there. I was fortunate enough to be one of those researchers, and Schultze's visit led to a collaboration which, frankly, changed the course of my career. In the decade that followed, Schultze would go on to collaborate with many mathematicians and produce articles and books totaling thousands of pages. He would also go on to win many awards, including the Cole Prize, the Fermat Prize, and the Leibniz Prize. As you know by now, Schultz's Fields Medal was awarded in 2018, but already in 2014, there were whispers that a medal was coming his way. Since he was so young, it was just a question of which year it was going to be. So, what exactly did Schultz accomplish, and why did it electrify so many people? To answer this, I must explain what it is that research mathematicians do. Many people are surprised to learn that mathematical research is a thing, because the math they learned in school was presented as static or already solved. But it's quite the opposite. Mathematicians will never run out of things to do because there are plenty of unsolved mathematical problems, and mathematicians come up with more every passing year. Problems in math are considered solved when a mathematician produces a formal proof, just like you might have done in grade school plane geometry. The result of solving a mathematical problem this way is called a theorem. But far from being an exercise in drudgery, a proof for a theorem can be considered elegant or even beautiful by mathematicians if it produces a maximally powerful result with a maximally simple or short, sequence of steps. To write elegant proofs, you need elegant definitions. 
For a mathematician, a definition is not quite like what you see in a dictionary. Rather, coming up with a definition is like writing down the rules for a new game. For instance, the axioms you use in those plane geometry proofs can be seen as a definition of the Euclidean plane. Their elegance and economy are the reason they've endured for 2,000 years. We also have a definition of the basic concept of number, as well as the concept of set. In the 20th century, geometers wanted to study some more complicated shapes than the plane, like this donut-shaped object or this shape. Alexander Grotendieck, who won the Fields Medal in 1966, gave us the definition of a scheme, a marvelous abstraction tying together all shapes that can be described using algebraic equations. Grotendieck's concept of a scheme was essential to all kinds of breakthroughs, from Pierre de Ligne's proof of the Vey conjectures to Andrew Wiles's proof of Fermat's last theorem. To these definitions, we now add Schultz's perfectoid spaces, as well as other exotic novelties, such as the diamond and the condensed set. Schultze and his collaborators wrote down definitions, proved the basic theorem surrounding them, and then they and other mathematicians used those definitions to solve all sorts of problems. Somehow, a dam had burst. The enormous opportunities to solve new problems meant that everyone working in the field of arithmetic geometry was now obligated to learn all things Schultzian. So, what makes a definition useful in solving problems? Brevity and simplicity are key. Schultze himself says that when he works on mathematics, he prefers to work without writing anything down. That means that he must formulate his ideas in the cleanest way possible. As he puts it, You only have some kind of limited capacity in your head, so you can't do too complicated things. I'd like to take this idea further and offer an analogy. A spider's brain may be too limited to grasp the large-scale structure of its web. It certainly does not have the coordinates of where each thread is to be placed, but it can still spin the web by executing a simple set of rules. In this analogy, the spider is the mathematician, the simple set of rules is the elegant definition, and the web is the complex mathematical object brought into existence by that definition. So, coming up with the right definitions, the right rules of the game, is much of the battle in math. Simple rules can produce complex and useful results. Once you have the right definitions, even the most difficult theorems seem to prove themselves. I haven't said anything yet about the actual content of Schultz's work. Now, Schultz's work spans quite a few topics throughout mathematics, but there's a common element to much of what he does, p-adic numbers and p-adic geometry. Let's talk about numbers for a moment. Everyone starts counting with what we call the natural numbers—1, 2, 3, and so forth. We learn methods for adding and multiplying natural numbers. Then, we learn about representing numbers in between the natural numbers using decimals, and we learn how to add and multiply those as well. At some point, we learn about numbers like pi, whose decimal representation doesn't end. But nonetheless, our rules for adding and multiplying extend to these as well. The numbers you can write down with decimals, infinite or not, are called real numbers, so-called because they can represent quantities in the real world. How many kilograms is Mount Everest? Or how many meters from here to the moon? The answers are real numbers. So we have here a decent definition, the rules of the game, for real numbers. Actually, there's one more rule we mustn't forget. 0.9 repeating equals 1. And more generally, a tale of repeating nines can be rounded up. Now, 
You may have found this rule strange when you first encountered it, and you might have even resisted it a little bit. If so, you might be stumbling upon some Schultzian ideas. Imagine a number system without the rule of repeating nines, in which point nine repeating really is less than one. It seems simpler that way. But this number system has some, let's say, continuity problems. If Zeno of Alea wants to move one meter forward, he will first have to move nine-tenths of the way, and then nine-tenths of the remaining distance, and so on. But without the rule of repeating nines, Zeno never makes it. Dropping the rule of repeated nines seems to exclude the possibility of continuous motion. What's left of the real numbers resembles nothing so much as a disconnected cloud of dust. When we reimpose the rule, the cloud of dust condenses back into the real number line. This is, in fact, the idea behind condensed sets, a deep new idea developed by Schulze and Dustin Clausen. The idea is that almost any shape can be thought of as a cloud of dust, together with a rule that tells you how to glue the dust back together. Anyway, after settling on the rules of the real number game, we can start talking about geometry. Arrange all the real numbers in a row, and you get a line. Add another dimension to create the plane, where each point represents a pair of real numbers called coordinates. An algebraic equation relating those coordinates determines a curve. The interplay between equations like this and the shapes they represent is called algebraic geometry. An algebraic geometer might look at an equation like this and say, of course, that's a hyperelliptic curve of genus 2, and its solutions look like a donut with two holes. So far, so good. Let's revisit the rules that govern real numbers. The digits are permitted to go off to the right without end, but what if we tweak the game a different way so that the digits are now permitted to go off to the left instead? The usual rules for addition and multiplication still apply. These new numbers don't quantify anything in the real world. But as mathematicians, we come up with definitions, the rules of the game, and then stand back and see what happens. What we have defined in this game are known as the 10 attic numbers, an entirely different number system from the reals. There are some similarities. In the real numbers, fractions like one third have repeating decimals. And in the 10 attic numbers, they have repeating decimals as well. In the real numbers, we impose the rule that 0.9 repeating equals 1. In the 10 attic numbers, there's a corresponding rule where repeating 9s give you negative 1. And finally, in the real numbers, irrational numbers like the square root of 41 have non-repeating decimals. The same is true for the 10 attic numbers. We have described the 10 attic numbers here, but by working with a base other than 10, you can define the p attic numbers for any base p. For reasons I won't get into, mathematicians usually only allow p to be a prime number. And in case you were wondering, the idea behind the name is to extend the pattern diadic for 2, triadic for 3, etc. Now, the p-adic numbers are nothing new. They were first described by Kurt Hensel in 1897. So what did Peter Schulze and his collaborators do with them? The answer has to do with the kind of geometry you get when you replace the real numbers with the p-adic numbers. What happens to the familiar real number line? Well, various attempts have been made to visualize the p-adic numbers, and all of them seem to have a self-similar or fractal nature. But none of them is perfect. Our little spider brains can't quite fully grasp the p-adic number line the same way we can grasp the real one. As an example of how mind-bending p-adic geometry is, consider the following two facts. Every triangle is isosceles, 
and every point within a circle is the center of that circle. Very strange. Another nice thing about real geometry is that no matter how complicated a shape may be, if you take a magnifying glass and zoom in on any particular spot, the shape becomes rather simpler. You can then figure out a lot about the shape by describing how these pieces fit together. But in piatic geometry, applying a magnifying glass to a shape doesn't seem to make it any simpler. The fractal doesn't become any less of a fractal when you zoom in on it. In the 20th century, brilliant luminaries made huge strides in this field. But it was Schultze who came up with the incredible idea of just using a better magnifying glass. Schultze discovered that when you zoom in ever closer on a piatic shape, a new sort of entity appears, and that's what a perfectoid space is. It's a little like the discovery of a new elementary particle, smaller than the atomic nucleus. Now that we know about perfectoid spaces and how they fit together, we can gain all kinds of new insights into p-adic geometry. Schultz's latest work, in collaboration with Laurent Fargue, is a 350-page treatise entitled Geometrization of the Local Langlands Correspondence. It came out just a few months ago, and my colleagues and I have been feverishly studying it. This new work strikes a dagger into the heart of something called the Langlands Program, which is sometimes described as a grand unified theory of math, bringing together so many different objects in math into perfect harmony. Naturally, intimate knowledge of perfectoid spaces is a prerequisite. At this point, you might be asking, this all sounds fascinating, clearly a lot of people are interested in it, but what is the real use of p-adic geometry? Does it have any practical applications? Now, as a mathematician, I am obligated to remind you that basically all the technology and science that makes society function rests at least partially on mathematics. But between you and me, when someone like Peter Schulze discovers new math, he's not thinking about applications or even anything related to the physical world. Instead, he's peering into a universe all its own. What others might describe as invention or creating, he might describe simply as learning. Learning about structures and patterns that are already there. As Schultz puts it, For me, doing research is really like discovering certain things that are just out there. The sense of discovering something that's there completely independently of the world. It's a unique sensation. Mathematicians may disagree on whether math is created or discovered, but they all agree that learning, writing, discussing mathematics brings a powerful sense of satisfaction and joy. A large part of this joy is sharing it with a community of like-minded souls. I myself am immensely grateful to have Peter Schulze in our community of mathematicians, and I hope you'll join me in congratulating him on winning the Fields Medal. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is David Farrar, and I'm the president of McMaster University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the public lecture of the 2021 Fields Medal Symposium. McMaster has a long-standing close relationship to the Fields Institute. One of the former chairs of our mathematics department, Dr. Carl Rehm, was instrumental in the founding of the Fields. Carl served on the board of the Institute and was one of the inaugural Fields Fellows. Two of the directors and three of the deputy directors of the Fields Institute come from McMaster. The ongoing partnership and close collaboration between the Fields Institute and McMaster are critical to enriching the academic environment. Together, we're able to bring the best scientific minds to Ontario. One of those brilliant scientific minds is Dr. Peter Schulze, a recent Fields medalist whose accomplishments are being celebrated with this year's virtual symposium. I welcome you to the symposium and wish you lively and interesting discussions. 
Hello, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. On behalf of everyone at York University, I want to thank the Fields Institute for bringing together so many distinguished guest speakers, scholars, and researchers in recognition of Peter Schultz's outstanding mathematical achievement in the field of arithmetic geometry and its applications. York University is profoundly grateful for its long-standing partnership with the Fields Institute and for the considerable role that it plays in advancing fundamental research and promoting novel applications of mathematics in the real world. For example, through its support of the National COVID-19 Modeling Task Force, chaired by York Professor Jim Hong Wu, which has provided integral advice to public health officials on assessing the transmission of COVID-19 and the trajectory of potential future outbreaks. As both the principal sponsoring university of the Institute and home to one of 11 flagship laboratories launched by the Field Center for Quantitative Analysis and Modeling, York University remains committed to expanding our partnerships with the Institute and working together to leverage our collective expertise and developing future opportunities for collaboration. Thank you, merci, miigwech. It's time now to welcome our special honoree, Peter Scholze. He will be engaged in conversation by Megumi Harada. Megumi is a professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at McMaster University. Her research is in equivariant symplectic geometry. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Megumi for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thank you, Kumar. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to have with us the Fields Medalist, Peter Schulze, today. Joining us in conversation, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. Thank you, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So our very first question for you is, how did you know that you're a mathematician? Yeah, but so I'm kind of from a more or less academic background, so my, my parents studied, my father studied physics, my mother studied computer science, my sister ended, ended up studying chemistry. At some point, several points in my youth, I somehow realized that I'm really interested in mathematics and uh, that I might also be somewhat good at it so that, I don't know, maybe a natural path to pursue. I, I think I just had some curiosity for mathematics and so some, at some point I've just found some book on mathematics uh, in, the, in the shelf at home and I just got really into it and just read the whole thing and yeah I found this really fascinating so yeah I mean also at school I, I, I was good at mathematics and so I also went to these mass olympiads and uh, I, this was my very big surprise I kind of did well at those and then I kind of got into that a little and on the other hand at some point I, I, fig I realized that this Fama's last theorem the Fama stated in the 17th century and that seems like such a beautiful elementary statement after many, many, many years had finally been proved a couple years earlier and then, but I also read that it was a really, really complicated proof involving lots of different mathematical areas. And I really got fascinated and want to understand this. And So it sounds like it was, it was always there for you, but the Fermat's last theorem was really something that... Well, I so mean, <laughs> it, it was one thing that pushed me in some direction maybe, but I think the, the passion for mathematics was there even before then. Um. Many people who are not mathematicians um, feel that mathematics is something that you're just born with. It's a talent. You either have it or you don't. Yeah? So I'm a mathematician, so I have my own opinions. But let's pretend that I'm not a mathematician. And I tell you, you know, um, mathematics clearly is just something inborn. You have something yeah, that you're born with. How, how would you respond? There's certainly people that at some point in their lives they develop a real drive for mathematics. But um, even if in school you don't think that you like mathematics, you might still figure out some point later in your life that you actually mathematics is something really interesting and you might might it, it might just be the right thing for you. Uh, and so, for example, one of my closest collaborators, Blagov Butt, I mean, I think he only started uh, mathematics really late as he came to the, I mean, he grew up in India and then he came to the US um, to, uh, to study engineering, I believe, first. And then only later on he realized that actually mathematics is some of his chosen paths. I mean, there are also all these stories of all these mathematical prodigies and they also exist, but 
it doesn't actually mean so much uh, as a research mathematician. Can you describe for us some of the moments, the aha moments, when you had some of your major discoveries that led to some of your big papers? There have been many different kinds. I think one was already hinted at at Jared's presentation. So there was this conference um, uh, in Princeton where I, I gave a talk about in some of more or less my, the first announcement of these perfectoid ideas. And then the right talk out right after that, Jared presented some some really interesting computations he had done, which just showed that some very natural object actually was such such a thing, was such a perfectoid space. And this, this was what started our collaboration. I mean, there's been other moments where, say, there's been a problem that I've been thinking about for quite a long time. And then it, I think it was during some hike uh, with the family that finally something clicked. And I, I, I figure, like, I, I realized how it should work. So you were outdoors and you were walking and... Often it's not like this very precise moment, but somehow sometimes it's just slowly you're, you're, you're feeling uh, how it should go. Um, or another time there was some problem I had been stuck on for quite a long time. And um, so I had some conjecture of something and I had really no way to attack it. But at some point I figured out that there's some kind of easier problem that I also don't know how to attack and where I was pretty sure that you could, you could say something. And I gave this problem to a master's student and... <clears throat> In his thesis, he solved, he solved this kind of toy problem. This was, but this kind of the insight he had there, this was really instrumental actually in, uh, in, my, in my work with Bhagav Bhatt on prismatic homology. It really sp was the spark that got us rolling somehow. So sometimes it's really in collaboration with others. Sometimes you're just thinking on your own, like in some random daily life situations. It's, I don't know. I mean, f mathematics for me is really a passion that I'm mostly thinking about all the time. So it can really happen in all kinds of situations. Can you tell us something about your experience of the pleasure of doing mathematics with other people? Is there a particular pleasure that you find that uh, you could tell us about, share with us? Well, it's just the pleasure of sharing ideas. Um, like, and sometimes also these ideas are generated in discussions, and I think that's particularly pleasurable, but also just the joy of explaining beautiful, interesting mathematics to others. Is it different for you where you speak to just one other person or you are working with a larger group or is it somehow, well, do you find it's different? Well, in most of my collaborations, uh, they, they are with a single person. And most of this, I, I mean, it's something you have more immediate feedback if you're talking to a single person than, than like a large group of people. And usually, I mean, I mean, there was this one instance where there was this 10 author paper that we wrote. Um, which happened, uh, so there was some kind of workshop organized where like 10 people took part in it and we did make some very good progress during that week of the workshop and then we wrote that paper as a 10 author paper together. But that's a very unique thing somehow. It wouldn't happen uh, for the, but for the workshop. Actually just this week some people are visiting me in Bonn and we are having some really, really nice intense discussions and it's a lot of fun. I really missed it. <laughs> We all did. We all did. We've been told that when you do mathematics, you don't um, do a lot of writing. A lot of it is just in your head. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, about the process by which um, you think about or you, you learn mathematics? I'm not a very organized person in general, so I don't have like a, a predetermined process I want, to, I want to follow, but uh, I just try to follow the ideas. and. Um, I know because I'm also like thinking about mass while hiking and while hiking you would never write something down. Uh, I somehow developed uh, uh, this way of thinking about mathematics without writing much down. And it kind of works for me uh, so far. Uh, maybe that will change. And uh, so I didn't yet feel the pressure to, to, to adapt to a better system. Wonderful. Um... So you just mentioned somehow mathematics is part of you know, everything you do, whether you're talking to friends or you're walking in the mountains. Um, can you tell us, for you, is doing mathematics different from doing anything else you know, in, in life? Is it different from music? Is it different from hiking? Is it different from... And if so, what's different about it? I mean, for me personally, it's, it's, it's a very special thing because it is my, my passion. And... Uh, uh, to the detriment of many other things I would probably also like to do, but don't much find the time for. Um, uh, I wouldn't say it's pro that it's probably much different for a musician who, who, who does, plays music or an artist painting. It's probably 
it might be very similar, I don't know. I haven't been in the situation, but uh, for me, it's certainly qualitatively different from the other things I'm doing. Sure, you're just drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Well, let's get back to your Fields Medal. So, could you maybe tell us the story of how you learned, yeah, that you had been awarded the Fields Medal? Where were you when you heard the news and, you know, what happened and how did you re react? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, it was in bon I was in Bonn at the time and uh, at some point uh, received this email from the president of the International Mathematical Union, which was uh, Shigifumi Mori at the time. And, yeah, and then you wonder what he wants to talk with you about. Like, he says, oh, can we, can we have a... Skype meeting. <laughs> oh, so he didn't tell you. He didn't tell you. No, he didn't tell me immediately. Like, can we have a like Skype meeting? <laughs> okay. I mean, actually, I had some independently some contact with him for another reason, so it wasn't like completely obvious. <laughs> and then, I mean, this was pre-pandemic, so I didn't have my laptop all set up, and so actually, I wasn't able to turn on my video for this this this, <laughs> this call. So it was slightly embarrassing that. But anyway, so you managed to connect. And then I managed to connect. I, I managed to connect, and then um, yeah, eventually he gave me the news, even even oh, without seeing me. Oh, on Skype. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously a huge honor. So yeah, I told my family. I bought a big bottle of champagne. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what does the future look like for you? Are you do you have um, new? Uh, you know, new frontiers, new ideas, things that you would really love to pursue? At the time I was getting the medal, I felt like I was just starting to do research. And so now I actually want to do some research. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yes, I mean, that, like right after um, uh, the last uh, International Congress, uh, Dustin Clausen came as a postdoc to Bonn and then we really started this whole new project that some emergent discussions then uh, about condensed mathematics and it's um, some kind of new language to talk about topology and this reorganizes reorganizes a lot of things in like pretty foundational mathematics and uh, it's quite fascinating to think about this so this is something I really want to think about more. You're moving in an entirely new area then. Well, I mean, it is very much inspired by previous things I've done. So there's, there's some kind of clear continuation, but it does definitely also take me into uh, new fields, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, I mean, then I've kind of finished this long-term project I had with Laurent Falk about local Langlands, and I mean, I'm also interested in the global Langlands correspondence. I mean, these are things I want to think about. I, mean, I don't have any clear plans, but yeah. I mean, yeah, there's so much, so much I would like to learn more about. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. It's been absolutely a pleasure speaking with you. So thank you again. <laughs> it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Megumi and Peter, for that engaging and inspiring conversation. Building on that, let's open up the discussion now to include some very distinguished mathematicians from around the world. Joining Megumi and Peter, we have Elena No, who is a professor of algebra and number theory at the Department of Arithmetic Geometry of the Freie Universität Berlin. We have Ramla Abdul Latif, Maitre de Conference on Mathematique at l'Université de Picardy, Jules Verne, and Eugen Hellmann, who is a professor of theoretical mathematics specializing in the field of arithmetic geometry at the University of Munster. So we're so honored and pleased to have with us today at this 2021 Field Medal Symposium a truly stellar cast of mathematicians who are ready to join us and share their insights and their passion for mathematics with the general public. In preparing for this panel discussion, what was most striking, at least for me, was the clarity with which the warmth of the human relationships among the four panelists among you came across, and I'm hoping very much that some of our discussion today can help the audience, not just me, to sense these special human connections that come from sharing a passion and how that is part of the experience of doing mathematics and how it may even shape the course of mathematics uh, itself. So Ramla, I was, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, in the terms understandable to, to the public a bit about what you're trying to do with Peter's uh, work and what happens when uh, you know, Peter's ideas are applicable, applicable in such a different context. And Ramla, in one of your emails to me, uh, you mentioned um, that you were working with a collaborator on using these perfected spaces in, in a quite different way than one might originally expect. Okay. Um, so the question came from a colleague that is definitely not a number theorist, like more algebraic ge geometer. And um, 
Okay, basically his idea is to trying to understand how behaves the sets of zeros of a given uh, polynomial equation. So, like, uh, if people have been to high school, they have met things like x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals 0, and they say, okay, I know that if x is 1, for instance, is, yes, minus 1, uh, <laughs> it's a solution. Uh, but in general, if you take a more general expression like that, then you cannot really control easily uh, the zero. You don't know where they are, you don't know how they behave, like are they stuck in some place of the space or something like that. And so here the, the question uh, that the colleague uh, and friend is interested in is, uh, given some nice equation, uh, can I say something about the size of a space that would contain all the zeros in some sense, roughly? Um, and a priori, the techniques that were used so far were really just like uh, geometric in the sense that they were really trying to see, can I say something on the space directly? And uh, one day we were at a very generic conference so in China. <laughs> um, so it was a conference with people that uh, basically studied in a way or another mathematics uh, with a Chinese student around them uh, that built a seminar in which they explained their own mathematics to each other. So you had probabilists and analysts and geometers like everyone. And for the 10th anniversary of this kind of meeting, they organized a big conference in China. And that's where I met this colleague that I haven't seen for ages. And he said, well, I was wondering, um, I've heard that there is some guy who was doing things that allows you to go between characteristic zero and characteristic P. You know about that? And I was kind of, well, are you talking about this perfect spaces? And I said, yes, I think it's something like that. And I was like, yes, okay. <laughs> And so he said, well, what do you know about that? So I said, well, I know the definition. And then we tried to discuss a bit. And so his idea was uh, to try to relate uh, some unknown cases to known cases in positive characteristic by using this uh, tilting thing, like the way you can go from characteristic zero to characteristic P, and hoping that here you could say something about the zero of the corresponding equation, and then go back to the characteristic zero and conclude that what you were looking for. So he's not expecting to solve the whole problem, but at least have some hints on that. And so that's how we started working on that. Wonderful, wonderful. As I said, there's a follow-up question here about exactly this phenomenon where somehow you take one idea and it's applicable uh, in many other places. So I'll just, uh, how about Eugen? Uh, do you, can you share your thoughts about this, this mysterious phenomenon that happened? Well, the this phenomenon certainly uh, happens quite a lot. It's, uh, um, uh, well, in my own research, uh, um, it's maybe a bit hard to, to precisely uh, describe what's, uh, um, what's happening and, and how this happens. But uh, like for me, I'm, I'm also a kind of piatic guy um, working with, uh, with piatic numbers and, uh, uh, and, and a number theory, and uh, then it frequently uh, turns out that uh, methods from geometric representation theory uh, uh, are extremely important to, uh, to what I'm doing. Um, and uh, well, um, this way you very often discover kind of uh, some, some branches of, of mathematics that you only had uh, a limited contact to so far. And, uh, that's certainly part of what uh, what makes uh, the whole business extremely exciting. Helen, what about you? Yeah, I'm not going to talk on perfectoid spaces. There are people who are uh, more competent on it than me. But uh, certainly um, analogies in mathematics, in pure mathematics, and uh, partly, in fact, uh, also related sometimes to some applications, Analogy, analogies are a driving force of uh, what we are doing. Uh, I could take a concrete example, uh, which, uh, which uh, predates uh, um, uh, Peter's uh, revolution in our uh, fields of research. Um, as we know, uh, Dolin in introduced an uh, extremely important uh, concept, which is a concept of weight. And uh, the way he did uh, was uh, by introducing weights uh, both in complex geometry and in geometry of a finite field. And 
one could say that uh, the analogy was successful because this enables him to prove, as we know, for example, the criterion was, for example, the solution of the uh, valid conjectures. And um, there is, uh, I have thought a lot, uh, uh, weights is very well documented uh, in the literature starting from Grotendieck and Deligne and going on and still in our days. But what was not very well documented at the time where I started thinking of this about 20 years ago was that uh, in hot theory, one very important invariant is the weights and another one is uh, F, the Hodge filtration. And in geometry of a finite field, uh, it was harder to recognize what would be the analogy to the Hodge filtration. And uh, thinking of this for a while uh, enabled me at some point uh, to understand uh, something which is close to what Ramla uh, explained earlier on, but over a finite field, under, under what circumstances one could produce rational points of a variety of uh, finite field. So uh, this is uh, because suddenly I understood what could play the role of the corner piece of the of the Hodge filtration on uh, on the side of uh, geometry of a finite field. So this is a very small example, mm -hmm. but uh, in uh, the fantastic thing about uh, Peter's uh, answer when he started and uh, gave us this as a present is uh, so to speak the. Uh, Theory itself was built immediately, as Ramla ex uh, explained, as a theory which uh, had the goal to uh, equate, in some sense, I mean, a mathematical sense, in the sense of analogy, to equate uh, geometry of a periodic field. Uh, I mean, uh, it's more complicated than this, but let's say, roughly speaking, geometry of a periodic field and geometry over a feeling characteristic P, which is not exactly a finite field, but which is a deformation of a, of a finite field. And uh, this, is, uh, this is fascinating because uh, this was the starting point of his huge work. And, uh, but again, the goal was to be able to understand a problem which was much older uh, than this, and in fact, which is not yet solved completely. And uh, because this problem, uh, which had been posed by Galenia, was solved completely on the side of uh, uh, geometry of a finite field and uh, geometry in characteristic P, but not geometry in characteristic zero of a periodic field. So um, this is a fantastic thing that those analogies uh, uh, are a driving force in what we do, in all what we do. And uh, Mostly, at least to my knowledge, for what I have been reflecting on, uh, those analogies are com always coming at some point from a try to understand a problem inside of the given theory. And at some point, one has to get out of the theory and uh, one has to try to find analogies which enable us to, to go one step further. Mm -hmm. And uh, this... Um, affected uh, theory which I don't possess, which I don't know very well, uh, one driving force to, in, uh, to introduce it was, was precisely to understand a problem which pre-existed already earlier on. Um, Peter, you haven't had a chance to speak of your own theory yet. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you agree? Is, is, is it, is it oh. somehow uh, analogy and metaphor that drives it's really a completely interconnected subject, and so it's, it happens so often to me that I was thinking about some question, and then suddenly I'm running into notions that I didn't expect at all to run into. So, so like a year ago or something like this, I was thinking about some questions uh, more about over the real numbers, and suddenly I was running into the notion of entropy, which of course is a right, really well-known notion in like physics, maybe in thermodynamics, or in also in computer science or something, but it's a notion that has never been on my mind. But suddenly there was some question I was contemplating and this inevitably led me to rec like, yeah, to, to, to entropy again. And uh, there are so many of these experiences here. Yeah. It's really, it's one subject, mathematics. Um, yes. And uh, uh, it's also about the specific 
I mean, that's very, something I very much enjoy about uh, mathematics. And uh, I try to work in some subjects where you really feel that different methods can really come together. Um, that's traditionally somehow always been the case in number series that uh, you need analysis, you need topology, you need differential geometry, you need everything. So maybe Peter will correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, but actually Clark's perfected spaces that he invented are a tool in periodic geometry. So they are not very like periodic numbers and periodic geometry is something which a priori is not too much connected to the to the real world, to kind of the the real numbers uh, and uh, and so on. But kind of Peter knew for a very long time that if you use this perfected spaces to to zoom in uh, into some kind of periodic geometric object, then it's a, then it becomes just like this uh, cloud of dust. Then he suddenly realized that uh, maybe something similar is uh, doable over the real numbers, which uh, which kind of led him to to develop this uh, concept of so-called uh, condensed sets uh, and and use this this thing, which is from my point of view, very much inspired by this periodic technologies, this perfective technologies, to actually do something um, with with the real numbers, which a priori belong in a completely different area. But as right. I said, and then when I did this, suddenly entropy came about. And, uh, yeah, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> so my next question to the panelists is: so when when one speaks about or learns about Peter's work and the truly revolutionary aspects of it. Um, um, and how it fits into the bigger picture, I, um, it seems unavoidable that one comes across the phrase, the Langlands program. But I'm imagining that for the general public, this is quite a new phrase. So I was wondering if I could ask the panelists, you know, how there are origin stories to, to many things. And so, for example, uh, for, in mathematics, there's a famous origin story for the Fermat's last th theorem, where many people have heard the story that, you know, it was scribbled in a margin of a book, and Fermat wrote that he has a marvelous proof, but he doesn't have room to write it, and so on. So that's a famous, famous story. You could say it's the origin story for that particular theorem. Um, so I was wondering if the panelists could perhaps share with the audience some kind of an origin story for the Langlands program. You know, did Professor Langlands just up and announce it at a workshop somewhere and everybody just got blown away? Or did it take several years for it to sink in into the community and how how significant it was? Or, you know, what, what exactly happened? Um, so, so perhaps, I don't know, maybe I should ask uh, Peter, maybe you can start this one. Uh. Well, I wasn't exactly around. You weren't there. <laughs> you weren't there. Oh no, you're too young. <laughs> oh, one sixty-seven. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's this one famous story that he wrote this 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 letter to Andre Veil, uh, uh, outlining his ideas about how how everything should work. Oh, so it starts with and, a letter. Like, uh, I think that's one of the origins. Like, yeah. Where, uh, yes. And. Like he even writes, like if you think this is nonsense, just throw it in the waste basket. You will have one nearby. <laughs> uh, so did it take a while for it to sink in and sort of become the Langlands program as it is now? I mean, now, right? It's it's such a yeah, no, it's a really thriving area with lots of options. Yeah. I, you. I mean, since for me, it's always been around, and I can't accept it. <laughs> I think oh, it's, how it it's a. Out it's <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, of course, I mean, it, it is a huge thing which covers it is, isn't it? really many aspects of, uh, I mean, basically it's a sort of a roof for the whole arithmetic geometry yeah. as, as, as we know it in our days. It was not like that maybe more than 20 years ago. It became like that because of the breakthrough of uh, Vladimir Drinfeld mm -hmm. and then what followed uh, using the, the ideas of Drinfeld, uh, the techniques went on. It was proved by uh, Laurent Laforgue and so forth. Um, but uh, we are in fact in the topic of the discussion we had before because the Langlands program essentially, this is an analogy. I mean, uh, roughly speaking, it's an analogy. That means uh, it's how uh, how uh, one could equate uh, 
uh, topological side uh, represented by a local system to make it very simple. So something which depends on the fundamental group, uh, which has some topological feature in it, uh, with uh, some coherent theories, which is called automorphic side. And um, so uh, we are precisely in, uh, in the topic we were, uh, we were touching a little bit before, is that uh, the Langlands program is, is this uh, extremely far-reaching and uh, deep vision of uh, how to equate those two sides. Is there, is there a way, is there a framework in which uh, we, could, we could tilt, in quotation mark, we could, we could jump from uh, one side to the other? And, uh, but uh, of course, uh, we are far of, uh, we are far from understanding the Langlands program. So uh, this, it's a huge, uh, huge, huge, huge uh, domain of, um, of uh, also, I mean, like, I mean, originally, like it was uh, envisioned by Langlands in some kind of restricted setting, but then with the work of Greenfield, with the work of Le Mans and so on, it, it, was extended to more and more areas where people realized that there are some kind of Langlands type correspondences. And so it's some kind of ever, ever branching out idea that's becoming more pervasive throughout uh, many areas of mathematics. Um. Um, so Eugen, I wanted to ask you because you are PhD students together, so clearly you've really done a lot of math together and discussed a lot together. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit, um, you know, when you work with Peter, when you're trying to learn something with Peter or so on, you know, how does it work? Do you now have to do everything in your head as well? Or, you know, what, what is it? Can you tell us a little bit, what is it like to, to do math with Peter? I'm not sure how much I can report on kind of actually doing math uh, together with Peter, but uh, I certainly can talk about how it is to discuss math with Peter, which, uh, well, certainly, or. Uh, maybe obviously for all the mathematicians who know Peter, is a quite of a quite uneven uh, experience. Uh, and well, and sometimes it, uh, it, uh, it always has been because since, uh, since I know him, uh, it, it was, well, okay, we met first when we were in high school and uh, didn't, I guess it's maybe fair to say that both of us didn't really know anything what kind of research in mathematics is about. Um, and uh, well, but uh, we, we met in this uh, training camp for the um, uh, German team for the uh, International Mathemat uh, Mathematics Olympiad. And uh, I guess it was more or less clear um, by, uh, from the very beginning that uh, Peter was certainly the brightest student there. Uh, <laughs> And then we didn't have so much contact, like a little bit, but but not so much until uh, he arrived in Bonn, where I had already been as a student. Uh, and um, it just so happens that we were kind of interested in the same kind of mathematics, that we both uh, wanted to do uh, arithmetic geometry. And uh, because of this, uh, we ended up having the same supervisor. Um, and... Well, when he arrived, this was maybe the, the only point in my life when our knowledge about techniques and mathematics uh, were maybe roughly the same level. And uh, after that, he, uh, <laughs> well, he, let's say, outlearned me uh, extremely fast. Uh, and, well, so it rather was always that, uh, in my, at least in my memory, Peter will correct me uh, if I'm wrong, that, that I would ask questions or that I would say, uh, like, uh, uh, I read something and I, uh, I, what, what I understood from this are that uh, things uh, behave that way. And uh, then Peter would uh, think a little bit about it uh, and, uh, well, usually just say that, uh, well, but isn't that wrong for trivial reasons, what you're saying? Uh, or, well, but uh, of course, that's one of the deepest problems. Um, or uh, <laughs> in, in very few cases, uh, ah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, this sounds like a, a, a reasonable problem uh, to, to think about or to, to talk about. Um, and um, uh, that one can kind of uh, go into this. And he would also, of course, be extremely generous in uh, sharing his ideas. 
Um, but uh, it was certainly never the case, I think, that uh, he would develop his ideas uh, in in discussions, at least in uh, in, in discussions with me. Um, I mean, like. Uh, well, actually, was, no. I mean, like when we were in Boston together. Yes. That was when I. That was when at the time that I really developed the ideas uh, that became this perfect word space and zero, and. I did actually sound them with you quite a bit. Well, you, you talked about them, but it's uh, <laughs> it's not <laughs> no, uh, it's the they they really... while we were talking. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't remember that you share them. Uh, that's uh, that's for sure. And you also share. I mean, yeah, that uh, Peter really likes to share this, uh, these things uh, while he's developing them. Um, but uh, kind of uh, well. The way he thinks about this, and and then it like he's usually progressed to a level uh, which is uh, uh, that advanced that um, uh, well, I mean it's it's rather sharing his ideas and and talking about his ideas uh, rather than kind of uh, um, discussing with me in order to develop these ideas. But I mean, like he certainly does have co-authors, uh, um, and uh, uh, I. I'm sure that he didn't develop all the things in his papers just alone and by himself. Uh, but uh, kind of for me, like when uh, when we grew up and were students together, it uh, it used to be like this. Uh, that um, at, yeah, at at some point in uh, in my life, it was like uh, I could I could ask him a question, and uh, it would be like. Uh, with the Roman emperor in the uh, in the Colosseum, um, when the gladiator comes and he could turn his thumb up or down, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> this would signal me whether uh, well I was on a good track or on a bad track. But maybe Ramla, you can provide us with some more general thoughts about just mathematicians in general. Yeah, we are so different, and we okay. find the beauty differently, don't we? I mean, yeah, definitely. We do. I'm sure I mean, you agree. You, you, you find the beauty in your in mathematics in your own way. OK, I can share my own experience and how mm -hmm. different it is from other people most of the time, let's say. Uh, I'm kind of the opposite of Peter. Like, I can't do math without writing, uh, but really, like, really can't. Like, if you explain me something just orally, if I'm not writing it in the next 30 minutes, it's basically then empty head. And I'm kind of, OK, what was it already? So I, I really have, like, um, uh, a writing memory in some sense. Um, and I, I need to do picture and I use a lot of colors. So, um, and the thing is that among my co-authors, some of them uh, work the same way. So that's really convenient, but some other, they're not writing much. So they're saying, oh, see, you do that and then you do that. And if you write this, then this should work. And by the time you go home, you kind of, uh, okay, what was I supposed to write already? And it's just like uh, very complicated. But if you go, I mean, uh, the beauty of the mathematics, I mean, I don't know. I, so maybe it's something I've learned from my advisor, but uh, like a, a correct proof should be beautiful. Like it, it shouldn't be like super messy. And so if it's messy, then maybe you can do it in a better way. And so you, you will be happy when in the end you, you feel like the proof is beautiful, like it's just natural. So I like to, to, to think about mathematics, like, of course, you first try to find one way, but once you have found one solution, either you say, okay, just move to the other pro to another problem, or you can say, well, isn't there a nicer way to go there? And I think mm -hmm. that's really part of the beauty of the thing, like having several paths. Like if, it's like when you go and you, you go for a walk, like you can just go the highway, which is not very nice, or you can say, okay, maybe I can find a nicer way, which is very convenient too, but like, I don't know, has trees or has a nice seaside. And that's really the thing, like either you just try to build highways or you try to find different paths. And I don't know, I like to find different paths and try to pick the nicest one. So maybe that's oh, my way of doing mathematics. That's very beautiful. And Peter is nodding the entire time that you were speaking, so I think he's. And Ellen, I'm sorry, you have not spoken in some time, I'm sorry. So perhaps you could share your thoughts about um, perhaps how you find um, the joy and the beauty in what you do. We do mathematics, uh, or I do mathematics because I love mathematics. I think this is all have in common. Uh, we, we love what we do. But uh, why do we love mathematics? 
it's, uh, I don't have an answer to that because why, why do I love this person? I love another person. I never have an answer to that. But at the end, of the day, I know I love this person and I don't love this person. <laughs> it is very simple, isn't it? <laughs> no, um, I mean, uh, there is, an, uh, there is some, in, some tendencies, some, uh, some attraction, some fascination, and, uh, and uh, we love it. But uh, if one really tries to understand why, it's a very, very complicated question because one can never love someone why we love something. One can give some elements of answer, but one cannot give a, a, a completely coherent answer. Now, um, um, one thing is for sure uh, for mathematics is that uh, uh, mathematics, they don't cheat. Uh, and we fight against the mathematics. They are not stronger than Peter, but clearly they are stronger than me. So, um, so it's a permanent struggle. And uh, it's a struggle where each step means a lot of effort. And um, I don't always choose two steps. So unlike Ramla, I'm really happy if I understand one step. And uh, I can I can put it aside if uh, one step is understood. Uh, one can put it aside and uh, see whether later on uh, there would be another way to reach the same goal. But uh, this is not the main concern because uh, what drives me and I think most of us is that we want to know. I mean, the, the main driving force because it's very very tiring to do mathematics is we want to know. I would agree that sometimes you're not done because you still need to understand. Ah, yeah. The, the self-check for me is really to write it down. Now, once it is written down, it can go anyways. It can be forgotten. It can be used for something else. It can be transformed because there is a better way. But uh, my uh, my state of mind and uh, my health, my mental health, <laughs> is uh, very, very different when I know it's correct or when I don't know it's correct. Because as you say, we don't have to look for a counterexample. So, um, and uh, when, uh, when we think of uh, the path we choose, it's also, uh, we choose, I, I, I'm a very secular person. I, I have no uh, belief in anything. I just choose what I can, what I can do. So uh, if I can do one step, uh, then I go this step. And from there, maybe I have a better perspective than from the step I was just before. So uh, I am uh, propagating, so to speak, the policy of uh, possibilities and reality. I'm very, very secular, very practical. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Ellen. And Peter, I think it's, it's <laughs> now I have to ask you for your turn. I guess I just gave Ellen a hard time to, to ask her to explain why she loves mathematics. So I will not ask you why you love mathematics. That's too <laughs> hard. Um, but maybe, maybe you can share with us some thoughts about um, different ways, yeah? How about that? Different ways one can approach a problem. Well, there's, there's this kind of tired classification of uh, mathematicians into problem solvers and theory builders. Um, yeah, do you believe does reflect, it? Uh, does reflect some reality. I mean, when you have a problem, you can either try to just <laughs> knock it down with all the tools you have available, <laughs> or you could try to really understand like um, the kind of general framework this fits in. Um, like what's going on on around not just the specific problem, but some of the landscape around it. And uh, maybe once you understand better in which kind of landscape it sits, you also get a better idea of which tools you actually use uh, to attack the problem. And uh, why would you? Why do you say all? Oh. Don't you think it's not possible to say? Well, I mean, as I said, it's a kind of it's no it's no sense, but, but, that's <laughs> I mean, when you want to, it's easier to explain the two extremes than to ex 
and of course everybody's somewhere in the middle of the ground. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, as one last question to the panelists, I'd like to ask each person if math still surprises you. Okay, so so Rama, go ahead, please. Well, I, I would say basically every day. Like each time, okay, every day I'm doing math. Let me rather say like that, okay? Uh, it, I mean, it can surprise me in good ways, like, oh, but actually it's working. Uh, or it can surprise me in not very nice way, like, oh, there is, like, what you call it, like a bear. Whoa, there is this family of bear, bear here. It wasn't on the guide. And, well, I don't really like that kind of surprises at first, but then when you manage to pass, like find another way uh, to overcome this family of bear, then not only can you see the valley, but for instance, you discover that there is the sea behind it. And basically it happens every day, every time I'm trying to prove something or find examples on things. Like very recently it just happened like, I was thinking, well, it will never work, but let's try it. And actually, it did work. And that was quite of a surprise. So, uh, yeah, I was happy with this. And Eugen? <laughs> Eugen, what about you? Well, I would agree with Ramla that uh, math does surprise me more or less every day I'm doing math. And that's uh, this is a extremely nice thing. But, um, well... You have to distinguish what kind of surprises you 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 have and uh, what, you, what you expect, because uh, well, I mean, the very good surprises are a very rare thing, I would say. I mean, like it, it can be that you uh, discover a truly new new phenomenon that uh, that uh, well people were not aware of. I mean, like okay, obviously that you were not aware of yourself, but then it can be it can be that it's a genuine new thing. I mean, okay. Uh, Depending which level mathematician you are, it can be a, a very big thing or just the smallest thing, but still something that was overlooked so far. Uh, and um, these are the true surprises, and uh, and these are the well, the the perfect surprises. And these ones are, are certainly rare. And Ellen, does math still surprise you? Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot. And. Uh... Surprise is, uh, is uh, one correct concept, uh, but uh, also there is a notion of joy and of sadness. So uh, if something doesn't work and uh, we had, so to speak, bet on it, um, or we were, we were really trying, hoping that it would work and it doesn't, then uh, there is a devastation uh, in sort of intellectual uh, sadness. But... Uh, the opposite is when it works, uh, and even if it is a very small uh, step, even if uh, in a way it's a small step, and in sometimes it doesn't really uh, immediately indicate what would be the next step, nonetheless, this one step is a pure joy. So, uh, yes, there is surprise, there is sadness, there is joy. I think it doesn't really differ from everyday life, right? This is the same thing. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's another source of surprises. I mean, every day, I mean, most mathematicians check the archive for new papers, and some, sometimes, quite often, there is some kind of very surprising new new paper out, or really something about some phenomenon you really that's really new to you, or you listen to some talk and there is something surprising and new there. Thank you, Peter. So I'm also uh, every day still surprised because I work on mathematics where I do a lot of, or rather, computational experiments to test out my conjectures. And I must say, uh, my computer tells me I'm wrong almost every day. So I have to fix my conjectures to, to make them correct. Um, so anyway, we should wrap up our panel discussion for today. So once again, all four panelists, thank you so much for joining us and for your generous uh, sharing of your time. And it was absolutely wonderful uh, to hear your insights today. So thank you again. Thank you, Megumi, Peter, and all the panelists for that very lively discussion, which gave us all some insights into how mathematics is done. I want to round out our program by inviting Professor Alejandro Adem to share a few thoughts with us. Alejandro is the president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. He's also professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia and has published more than 70 papers in algebraic topology and group cohomology. Prior to assuming the presidency at NSERC, 
Alejandro served as the CEO and scientific director of MITAX. And before that, he was the scientific director of the Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Alejandro is a tireless advocate for excellence and research opportunity. We will also hear from Professor Carlos Kenick, the president of the International Mathematical Union. He obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago. After being an instructor at Princeton University and a professor at the University of Minnesota, Professor Kenick returned to the University of Chicago, where he is now Louis Bloch Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Mathematics. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and has spoken thrice at the International Congress of Mathematicians. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. It is my great pleasure to join you today to celebrate the remarkable achievements of Peter Schulze on the occasion of the 2021 Fields Medal Symposium. C'est avec grand plaisir que je me joins à vous aujourd'hui à l'occasion du Fields Medal Symposium de 2021 pour souligner les réalisations remarquables de Peter Schulze. Though he has been lauded for his contributions to the field of arithmetic algebraic geometry, Dr. Schultz's contributions have had an amazing impact on many areas of mathematics. His reputation as one of the world's leading mathematicians is made even more exciting by the knowledge that he still has a long career ahead of him. ENSERC is a proud supporter of the Fields Institute because it shares ENSERC's vision to use discovery and collaboration to advance knowledge and innovation. Centre Canadien Faculté de Recherche en Mathématiques, le Fields Institute réunit des mathématiciens du Canada et de l'étranger qui collaborent afin de relever des défis ayant des répercussions à long terme sur le plan social. It has been noted many times over the last year and a half that the world has seen just how vital science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are for overcoming the greatest challenges we face as a society. The Fields Institute has been a valuable partner in Canada's contributions to COVID-19 research. Just last spring, the Institute received significant funding to establish the Mathematics for Public Health Initiative. Ce réseau multidisciplinaire de collaborateurs élabore des modèles, des politiques et des formations qui permettront d'améliorer la capacité du Canada de faire face au futur défi de santé publique. This builds on the work of a task force organized by the Fields Institute in 2020, which played a considerable role in modeling the virus in Canada during the early months of the pandemic. I would like to applaud the members of the Fields Institute and Dr. Peter Schulze for their contributions to mathematics and beyond. Their far-reaching impacts are creating great benefits for citizens in Canada and around the world. From myself, and on behalf of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, thank you and congratulations. Merci et félicitations. Hello, everyone. I am Carlos E. Koenig, the president of the International Mathematical Union. It is a pleasure for me to take part in this year's Fields Medal Symposium, honoring Peter Schulze. The Fields Institute and the International Mathematical Union, IMU, have a long and close relationship stemming from the fact that J.C. Fields, for whom this institute is named, was the initiator of the Fields Medal Award, the flagship award of the IMU, which is now recognized by many as the most prestigious award in mathematics. J.C. Fields was the lead organizer of the International Congress of Mathematicians, ICM, held in Toronto in 1924. After the Congress, there were unspent funds that had remained. Fields, who was very concerned with the lack of an award for mathematicians of the stature of the Nobel Prize, thought that it would be a good idea to use these remaining funds to endow a new prize in mathematics. It was planned that he would advance this idea at the 1932 ICM in Zurich, but he died in Toronto in the summer of 1932 before the Congress. In his will, he left a substantial amount of money for the purpose of establishing the prize, and this money added to the leftover funds from the 1924 Congress and endowed the prize. After Fields' proposal was accepted by the 1932 ICM in Zurich, 
The first Fields Medals were awarded at the ICM in Oslo in 1936. Before his death, Fields explicitly asked that the award not be named after any person or place, but this wish was overruled after his death. Fields' conception of the awards was that they should be in recognition of work already done and an encouragement for further achievement in contrast with the Nobel Prize. Following his wishes, the Fields Medals are now awarded every four years on the occasion of the ICM to recognize outstanding mathematical achievement for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. Currently, four medals are awarded to candidates under the age of 40. Over the years, the trust fund established by Fields has had to be periodically replenished and it is still significantly underfunded. The discrepancy in 2018 was made up by the University of Toronto and the Fields Institute. From 2022 onward, the IMU has been very fortunate to be able to secure stable funding to cover this discrepancy from the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation. Let me conclude by thanking the Fields Institute for their collaboration with the IMU, by congratulating Peter Scholze for his award and for his extraordinary contributions to mathematics, and by wishing all of you a very productive symposium. Thank you to all our participants today for your thoughtful and insightful comments. Each of you has added valuable perspectives and paid tribute to both the wonderful world of mathematics and the transformational work of Peter Scholze. The comments of dignitaries and leaders, Jared Weinstein's explanation of the work, and the discussion, superbly moderated by Megumi Harada, certainly helped all of us, whether we're practicing mathematicians or admirers from a distance, to get a glimpse into the exciting work that Peter was recognized for. Thank you to everyone who has helped make this happen. This has been another memorable public opening of the Fields Medal Symposium. For the last little while, we came together to live in the world of mathematics and to forget all the distractions of the outside world. True to the spirit that animated John Charles Fields' vision of mathematics, and more generally of science, as a way of unifying us, we have enjoyed each other's company and the company of inspiring ideas. Let's take that collaborative spirit forward and together tackle not only the big problems of mathematics, but the big problems of our world. Right now, the pandemic is still on the minds of many people. We've made a lot of progress in the last 18 months, but there is still work to be done. The Fields Institute is deeply involved in this work. We have redoubled our efforts in the mathematical modeling of the pandemic and its related effects on society. To do this, the Institute formed a partnership with all of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institutes in Canada and is now expanding to explore international collaborations as well. We are all keenly aware of the real suffering around the world caused by the pandemic. But I'm confident in the power of science and mathematics to prevail. Beyond the pandemic, the Fields Institute is making plans to apply mathematical techniques to global challenges through its new initiative called Fields Magic. Stay tuned as we unveil these plans. I would like to thank our sponsors whose generosity makes it possible to hold the Fields Medal Symposium. A big thank you to Elsevier Publishing and longtime friend of the Institute, George Elliott. Our special event today was possible only because of the dedicated efforts of the Fields Institute staff who have worked tirelessly to put this program together. I'd like to publicly thank them for their efforts. In these times, we grow our community by fostering the connections we make through our networks. If you like what we are doing and you believe in what we are capable of doing, I encourage you to share your thoughts and your experience here today through whatever medium you're most comfortable. You can tag Fields Institute on social media. Thank you again for joining us today and taking part in the online public opening of the Fields Medal Symposium. I hope you will stay in touch. And for those who are interested, the scientific program related to the Fields Medal Symposium continues through this week. I encourage you to watch for upcoming public events, such as our popular series, What the Numbers Say, connecting people with the mathematicians and scientists working on today's most urgent problems. Most importantly, 
please stay safe and healthy. Until we meet again, keep well, my friends.